The sustainability has never felt so good. By choosing Tencel, you're putting nature first. From nature, we create fibers from renewable wood sources that are delicately woven together for a natural feel-good comfort. Tencel, feel-good fibers since 1992. Good morning, good afternoon. Hi, my name is Alice Jividen. I am the Senior Content Strategist here at the Business of Fashion. Welcome to today's BOF Live. Um, it's great to see so many of you joining already. Please use the chat function to say hi, to connect with one another. Um, let us know where you're tuning in from as well. It's always great to see how global our community is. Today, we are tackling a pretty big question. It's around how can fashion rethink the end of life of products? Um, I'm sure we don't need to tell many of you on this call today that globally, the fashion industry is responsible for around 40 million tonnes of textile waste a year. Um, and that's that we know of, you know, most of which you know, is either sent to landfill or incinerated. It is among the most unsustainable industries on the planet, responsible for around three to five percent of global carbon emissions. We see oil based polyester accounts for about 50 percent of fiber production and cotton, which we know is hugely reliant on large volumes of of water, of land, fertilizer, pesticides. That that is another 25 percent. So we know that. The industry needs a, a kind of a systems change and overhaul, and that change is going to require a collective and coordinated push from manufacturers, suppliers, designers, brands and retailers right the way across the value chain and you know across the industry. And it really requires collaboration on a new scale that we haven't seen before. Um, there are some promising shifts and steps. Circular business models are on track to become a $700 billion market by 2030. Shifts not quite happening fast enough, nor at a great enough scale. Sourcing sustainable fibers is a critical step in fashion's efforts to really reduce this impact. But there are barriers to scale. There are barriers to adoption. And of course, there is the fundamental issue of overconsumption as well. However, over the next 40 minutes, we're going to, yes, touch on some of those macro issues. But ultimately, you know, this is a conversation about education and about solutions as well. So we're going to consider fashion's waste problem. We're going to take a look at something called extended producer responsibility. We'll look at transparency and traceability. And then finally, we're going to look at some really exciting solutions on the horizon. So to do this, I'm delighted to be joined by two leading experts in this space. Florian Hubrando is the VP of Global Textiles Business at Lensing Group. Lensing is a fiber manufacturer supplying the global textile and non-wovens industry with fibers derived from certified like renewable wood sources. Tencel is its flagship brand and it's perhaps its most famous and widely recognized among brands and consumers. Um, but there's much more to its offering, which I'm sure we'll discuss. Florian, it's great to have you with us. Thanks for having me, Alice. Thank you so much. And we're joined here by Nina Morenzi, who is the founder and director of the Sustainable Angle and the Future Fabrics Expo. Um, the Expo is the world's largest curated showcase of sustainable textiles. Nina also set up the Sustainable Angle back in about 2010, I believe, to initiate yeah. and support projects that, that help to really reduce the impact of, of the industry. Nina, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, before we get started, there's loads to talk about. Just uh, the final bit of housekeeping. If you do need any help while you're watching during today's live, our customer support team is available via the chat as BOF events. So I really want to kick things off by thinking about the, the waste problem within the industry. Um, fashion's impact is significant, but it's also murky waters. You know, it does involve sometimes piecing statistics together. And there are lots of things where we don't know they're und undisclosed. Florian, you know, what insights can lensing share into the extent of, of fashion's waste problem and, and what we're dealing with? Mm. I think as, as most of, of us know, it's it, it's indeed it's a huge issue, right? I think there are, there are many numbers floating around. I'm gonna not gonna recode too many of those stats, but I think the, the single biggest number I think that says it all is that less than one percent of our clothing is actually being recycled, right? So if you think of everything we as an industry produce, each one of us only 1% or less actually over 1% finds its way back into clothing. Mm. And I think just, just says a lot about how linear this, this industry is and how uncircle it currently is. Just um, 
actually this morning I read a report, I think it was from Changing Markets, where last year in 2021 alone, just for Kenya, I think uh, the country received, I think, 900 million items of waste clothing and, and uh, only a very small fraction can actually be re reused. More than half is, is, is being rent, landfilled, uh, either burned or ends up in the nature. And the majority of this is also synthetics, right? That don't necessarily biodegrade. So indeed, I think the, the, the challenge is massive at this. In Europe, we're now collecting, I think, 30% of the waste and we're hoping to, do, to collect more. But if you then don't use that waste properly, right? And can get something out of it, even, even the collection doesn't help, right? So I think that's where we are at. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, it's the context is is terrifying as you say florian yeah. it's so many statistics and it's so horrifying and and actually you know, i actually saw something the other day where consumers were kind of rejoicing at all the plastic that had been pulled out of the ocean and the top comment this was on a tiktok video was like but now what what do we do with it there is this sense of what do we do with waste um nina with this context in mind the future fabrics expo i'd love to know what were kind of the key drivers that drove you to, to founding it? And also perhaps have, how have you seen demand kind of uptick for more sustainable solutions? Um, yes, so it was back in 2011 that we hosted the first Future Fabrics Expo and it was much, much smaller and it was at the London College of Fashion. And now we are on over 3,200 square meters packed with about 10,000 textiles all sustainably responsibly produced. Of course, there's a lot of tensile fabrics in there as well and others produced with lensing fibers. But ultimately it was supposed to be really to make it as easy as possible for the design and the fashion industry to find these uh, alternatives uh, to conventional cotton and virgin polyester, and to really give them the chance to diversify the fiber basket, which is, as you said before, is very much dominated by those two. And, um, and so, you know, it's interesting to see how it evolved over more than 10 years. And I would definitely say um, the solutions are being, it, it, it's from anything to do with different fibers to simply how many more colors there are if you walk into the Future Fabrics Expo, um, how many different materials there exist now that we didn't have 10 years ago. And just also how the, the industry responds to it and how the brands are really, you know, they're knowledgeable now. And in the beginning, they didn't know much about it. So it was about education and it was about giving as much background information as possible to explain why these materials have a reduced impact. And to now see that the teams are coming really with you know, it's not just the designers and the buyers um, and the CSR teams, they really come together with marketing, with communication, with perhaps store merchandisers. It really is amazing to see what drive there is now to find these solutions. When you have people coming to the expo, um, how, you know, the, the audience, and particularly I'm thinking about brands in terms of, you know, in, in and retailers or whoever, in terms of size in terms of scale and scope has that changed at all you know is this emerging brands are there some heavyweights that are kind of engaging in this space um i'd say there's definitely a very loyal um uh base of visitors uh you know it's people who really cared right from the beginning um and how are delighted to see how many solutions there are now but i would say it goes now across the entire sector really it's not just the different types of brands big small uh, emerging uh, very established old fashioned brands uh, high street sports everything really yeah. but also to see who's coming as i said it really is interesting how that has changed and it's it's a very wide base um and i'd say also now you know it is much larger than just fashion it's now also a creative industry in general there's architects coming there's a lot of people working in innovation uh people from the finance industry coming, impact investors who are looking for that. So it's it's a very different landscape than it, it used to be. Yeah, I mean, when we're talking about textiles, we guess this conversation is rooted in fashion, but the textile industry is is enormous and there are so many adjacent industries and that conversation is, is so yeah. big. So encouraging to hear that there are so many different touch points engaging in this. Um, Florian, if... If we're seeing demand for less environmentally intensive materials, you know, we also know that there we have this waste problem that is, you know, it's critical to address. How should fashion brands, you know, really be rethinking their material portfolio today? Yeah, I think there's a few things that brands can already do today. I think um, I would start with, uh, um, of course, the, the using natural fibers wherever possible, because that even if collection rates are low, right? And even if a lot of things are being uh, being landfilled eventually, or if 
washed washed out and, and, and fibers, um, microfibers are getting emitted, at least it's natural, it's biodegradable, right? I think that's one thing. The other thing is, of course, to do and, and manufacture your garments that they are more likely to be recycled, right? That they are, it's easier to, to recycle them. I'll give you one example from our, our, our own lives here at Lensing. Um, we do sell fibers that have a, a part of it made out of waste. So typically all of our fibers have wood as raw material. We have some fibers though, we call them refibra, hence the refibra, but 30% of, of the raw material is actually cotton waste, right? So we use some of that waste. However, when it comes to sourcing that waste, uh, it, needs to be, it, it, it needs to be relatively pure. We cannot deal with blends with a lot of synthetics and colors. Right? Yeah. So there are certain rules to it, certain limitations to it today that then allow us to recycle it or not. So I think that's something very important to be uh, to, to keep in mind. So typically try to avoid too many different blends and try to stick to natural fibers. Right? Mm -hmm. So blends of natural fibers are always easier to work with. Um, and, the, um, and I think that's, um, that's maybe the third thing is that wherever possible, try to use recycled materials already. And when I mean recycle, it's really fiber to fiber, right? I think you, you mentioned the bottle to fiber example, which I think is good, right? I think it's, it's better than virgin synthetics for sure, but better yet, of course, is a true fiber to fiber circularity. And, and this industry is starting to do this now. We've started, I, I remember, I think it was in 2017 when we launched the product, it was nascent, it was really small. We've added a little bit of cotton waste uh, that used to be a garment or used to be fiber in our wood fibers. And it's been grown ever since. And now we're talking thousands of tons. And I think, you know, it's, it's way to go, of course. Yeah, definitely a way to go. But this conversation really is about looking at these small but significant steps. So, it, you know, it certainly feels encouraging. And that kind of leads me nicely on to this sort of next section that I really want to delve into. Um, I want to consider how legislation is actually going to make some of those shifts that you were just talking about and outlining an imperative, like a business imperative, fundamentally. Yeah. Um, we've talked about this before, Florian, Nina, I've also mentioned it to you. We've discussed the, you know, the European Union and national governments in the EU um, are pushing for laws and regulations that promote a more sustainable textile industry, fundamentally. They include things like um, clearer information on textiles, a digital product passport, you know, information on circularity, tighter controls on greenwashing, all really important, pretty significant stuff. But there's one um, in legislative exploration that is ultimately about pushing for harmonized EU rules on something called extended producer responsibility oh. for textiles. Yeah. Florian, can you start by telling us, you know, what is this? So like what legislation is on the horizon? Yeah. So in, in general, the concept you know, behind it is that the, the, the company that produces a certain good is also responsible for its afterlife. Right? So what happens to the good after the end of end of use? And that concept has been used in other industries, whether it's electronics or white goods, mm -hmm. so that, you know, you're not just thinking as a producer at the production, then whatever happens uh, when people throw it away is none of your business anymore, but that you also take ownership and responsibility for whatever happens afterwards. And typically um, what happens is that when you sell the product, you, know, you have to add a certain, you have to add a certain amount of money to it that covers all the costs that society has to deal with this product after its life, whether this is collection, um, recycling, and and uh, and the likes, and I think that concept is fundamental to turn our industry from a linear one to a circular one, right? I think it needs these kind of incentives to reshape our thinking as an industry in terms of what materials we want to use and also influence consumer behavior. So mm -hmm. it's something that's at least I'm very much looking forward to. I think this can provide a, a real shift, and you must also not forget that you know while this might be an extra cost. Typically, these schemes, they also have certain modulations in it where then you can reduce that cost if the material you bring into circulation is more sustainable than others, right? So if your product is particularly durable or made out of, re out of recycled content in the first place or easier to recycle afterwards, then this uh, additional burden will be less. So I think it's, a, it's a, not a you know, one lump sum, uh, one, one price fits all approach. It's typically more nuanced that incentivizes um, circularity or the design of the product. Hmm. It's interesting that you mention 
about the cost because fundamentally when I have I have a lot of conversations like this and I hear from brands and businesses yeah. I hear concerns about who bears the cost you know if we push for industry-wide EPR what is there a chance that some of that cost could sit with the consumer like if that's how brands kind of approach it is that right do you think consumers would pay for that or should it be shouldered by by producers I think well, eventually the idea is that it's uh, originally, of course, it will happen on the retail level, right? Mm. And I think then we'll see whether this cost will be pushed over to consumers and whether they accept it. I would hope that there's also transparency that comes with it, right? So that uh, on retail level, you have to say, you know, this garment has an extra cost of X uh, because of that. And then mm. if you then compare garments and other certain garments have a, low, have, a, have a lower surcharge because they are made of recycled material or they are easier to recycle, then I think this could actually um, evolve into the right choices being made on consumer level. I think consumers understand, ah, you know, certain more sustainable garments are cheaper in a way, or not cheaper, but then I have a lower surtax, and that's why I go for that particular choice. Interesting. Can I come in here with, with one comment, actually, if I may? Um, I think it's quite important to understand that at the moment, we are all paying for it, for the pollution. Because, you know, the polluter pays principle, which is another way of saying EPR, actually means that, you know, the polluter isn't paying at all. And so the taxpayer, which is all of us, are paying for the increased cost that is needed to clean up the pollution. So whether that is, you know, uh, water treatment facilities in, in municipalities, et cetera, all of these, that, that means increased cost because of increased pollution. And therefore, that's paid by the taxpayer. So ultimately, we're already paying for it now. Plus, of course, you know, the health impact. So that's these are all hidden costs that we are kind of ignoring. But um, so it's high time that this is being addressed. Absolutely. It's a really astute point. And Nina, I'd actually love to come to you now, um, really about engaging the consumer in this. You know, we, Florian was just talking about circular models. I know we're going to come to that more later on. But, you know, when we think about circularity, we are reliant on the consumer to engage in those models for them to be successful. What, as the fashion industry, what do we have the power to do? Um, I think one of the main things really is to see how much we can educate the consumer. I mean, educating sounds a bit haughty, but, you know, how can we share knowledge with them and how can we explain what's actually happening? And so um, ultimately, I think we need to understand, again, the value of a product, mm -hmm. uh, what's behind an item of clothing. And of course, you know, there's certain things that are perhaps a bit more tangible to understand than others. Um, I think an important one here is, you know, fashion can be an, a, a very good communicator and, uh, and uh, a vehicle for change. And so if we're using that the right way through, for example, clever labeling, not clever in a bad way, but just by really, you know, having proper clear information shared as to how a product is made, um, and, and we're going to talk afterwards, of course, about traceability and transparency. But all of these things, if they are properly communicated, it really has a great educational um, uh, function, uh, which then can actually have a knock on effect on other lifestyle uh, choices that a consumer makes. And uh, so I think in that sense, where, where fashion has a very important role to play and labeling is a typical one that I think we can engage consumers with and ultimately I think also people are ready to understand more what goes into a product um, uh, perhaps that's only a small segment now but it's it's a clear uh, driver of change I think we're noticing that but you know there's a lot of uh, I'd say initiatives who are now looking at how we go back to from a small primary school age to tell children again how things are made and what are they made of and what are the inputs so that was a typical one that was in the fixing fashion report uh, recommendations to the UK government which was those are some of the main points that were being uh, emphasized so that people really understand again the value of what goes into a product and so I think that way we can engage the consumers much more. I completely agree with you. I, I, I think we forget the the fashion industry is you know a, we're very powerful storytellers. That it's a business built on telling beautiful stories to consumers, and if we could channel some of that energy and focus into communicating the provenance of product, um, I think that's a you know something that could be really powerful. I'm going to kind of we're going to move on now and dig into traceability and transparency. We've already mentioned this a couple of um, a couple of times today. Um, the EU regulation as well, the digital passports, clearer logged information on textiles. This is definitely 
something that's moving from the kind of edges of consideration and kind of firmly into the mainstream, firmly becoming front of mind for so many brands. Um, but Nina, if I could begin with you, when we consider future fabrics, traceability should this be absolute table stakes is is this now a critical metric that we can't afford to go without how important is it as well to to the end consumer um absolutely i'd say it is clearly um, an enabler of circular business models for sure i think it will um it actually gives confidence, especially in a time when we have so much greenwashing going on, so many claims uh, are circling around about how something is more sustainable. Um, having an actual trace traceability item in there is, is fundamental. Um, I, I think it also, what it basically does is, is you are creating a full uh, storytelling item as well you get a lot of uh, I think what's important it also gives a it creates a virtuous um, cycle so when a when a company a brand knows that it works with fibers that it can actual, uh, actually trace um, through the entire supply chain it enables them to actually talk about that and tell that story and that again has a knock-on effect on everyone else realizing okay this is real this is tangible this is you know you can prove this and that then has a whole um a sort of a positive feedback loop. So I think that's definitely something that is important and often forgotten on on trade, not forgotten, but it's it's a very important part in in the whole debate on traceability and transparency. But yes, it's absolutely it's 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 fundamental also, of course, to resale, to rental, to all of these uh, circular business models. Mm. Out of interest, at, at the Future Fabrics Expo, um, when you're considering the fabrics to exhibit, are there sort of certain standards that you expect in relation to traceability and, and to, to transparency as well? I mean, we have to rely a lot on, on certifications. Um, lensing in that case is actually a little bit different because it's a fibre maker and I'm sure um, Florian is going to go into that. But ultimately, yes, we are very much have to rely on anything uh, that is actually traceable, that we can show exactly the whole um, uh, uh, chain of custody, as it's called. Um, and there are different certification standards for different fibers. So it, it is absolutely crucial. Yes. And of course, the more you can trace it back to the fiber and you can actually trace that all through to the end of the, the product, because it's still in there. Um, that is ultimately the sort of the gold standard. And I'm sure Florian is going to talk about that and how that works with, with tensile fibers, for example, because it's fascinating how you can now have a, a tracker in the fiber. Yeah, Florian, can you please give us some insights into the work that Lensing is doing around traceability? Sure, no, ha happy to do so. So what in indeed what we do for all of our specialty fibers, uh, for our tensile layer cell, tensile modal, the fibra, but also the ecovero fibers, they now come with a you know, little chemical tracker in it that allows it to really identify the fiber all the way through its life, basically. So it receives that tracker in production and then whether it's on yarn level, on knitting, on weaving level, dyeing, finishing level, or even on the garment later on, even what you are wearing now, if it was made out of tensile, we could detect it, right? So you take your, your garment, uh, we put it onto uh, an optical device and we can, it gives us a signal to say, okay, that this fiber is really lensing. And we see that this is very important to an increasing number of brands and retailers because that need for transparency and, and uh, is, is getting more and more important for the obvious reasons. And I think we've seen a lot of you know, uh, interest in that technology and it's, it's getting adopted extremely well. Um, the second type of traceability that we are offering that we see also quite a, quite a bit of demand for is the what we call digital traceability that goes via a fiber coin. And there are several technologies out there. I and mean, the one we've teamed up with is Textile Genesis, where basically for every fiber we produce, we can emit a little digital twin, we call it a fiber coin, that's then being sent to the spinner and then, then continues its journey alongside the fiber all the way to the garment. So when the brand and retailer receives the garment, it also receives the equivalent amount of fiber coins with it. And with those fiber coins, the fiber, the brand and retailer then can see which journey traveled through the value chain. So not only do you know it's lensing fiber, you also know where exactly it was being processed, spun, woven, finished. And that also just lately, if, if we've seen more and more brands and retailer asking for those fiber coins. So uh, we have a separate team here at Lansing that's emitting those fiber coins. And we have a, you know, it's almost like a, a weekly dashboard where we look at this and you see the number of fiber coins that go out is increasing. And I think that's very, um, that's very um, 
intriguing and encouraging because it shows that that need for transparency is there, right? And there's a couple of brands that actually say, whatever wood-based cellulose fiber we buy, it needs to come with traceability. Mm. I mean, the need is, is certainly there, but I'm wondering how significant do you believe that traceability is in building competitive advantage? I think it's absolutely crucial, right? I think, I mean, yeah. especially think about claims, right? So whenever you want to make a claim at the very end of a brand, or you want to honor certain commitments for recycling shares or uh, material you use, you know, certain sustainable material, you need to know, right, that you're really hitting your target. You need to know that the garment you have in your hand is really made out of a, of a recycled material. How can you make that claim? How can you be certain if you don't have any proof, any, any transparency and traceability? So that whole discussion of setting targets, meeting them, and, and needs to go hand in hand with transparency. Otherwise, you even you don't know what you're talking about, basically. Right? So I think it's and only then you can make those claims that are a competitive advantage. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm interested, actually. You mentioned that you collaborate with Textile Genesis. Um, you know, and at the start of this, at the start of this conversation, we talked about the need for kind of collaboration that we haven't really seen before, mm -hmm. like at scale across the industry. So I'm just curious why you've chosen this collaborative strategy to to achieve your goals and you know should the industry be doing the same elsewhere yeah so indeed now when we this this whole idea of traceability also once was an internal discussion actually as lensing and we thought no should we not develop our own technology and then you know, offer this but we thought that the adoption of a trans transparency technology by the wide industry is likely more is more likely to happen if it's if it's provided by a third party right so and not a, a particular fiber producer and that's why we in that case went really for a third party solution and we see more and more other companies joining that and other initiatives but i think it's important that it's it doesn't come from one particular producer whether it's us or someone else but it's a, like a third party so that a neutral as neutral as possible party and and it and that it's used by many right and i think it, the sooner we um, we kind of uh, converge on one or two you know, solutions out there, I think the better. And uh, it can only work with, with if we all use a certain subset of technologies, right? If we all come up with our own stuff, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Nina, do you see much collaboration um, with either competitors or adjacents in your corner of the industry? Do you see things that excite you? You mean between brands and and uh, companies like Lensing and so on? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I don't want to only uh, uh, talk about things that we represent, um, but you know, for example, the announcement the other day, which is very topical, which was um, uh, it was Miram by Natural Fiber Welding, which opted for a ten cell backing. Um, that's you know that's a typical thing that you feel you know when you feel it it's amazing um it's completely plastic free these are the kind of new developments that they wouldn't be able to do alone um and so of course again if you can then it, often the backings are forgotten and then you have an amazing new material but actually the backing is just some whatever conventional cotton or maybe even has some uh something in there that really shouldn't be teamed with such a fabulous product as as miram um, those are the things that are terrific for designers to work with then ultimately and create great, great products and have great stories with it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, there's lots of them and those are the most exciting ones for sure. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to turn now to sort of our final section of the conversation, but it's certainly the most meaty and I think there is probably the most to say here. Um, I wanted to turn to something that feels promising. Um, we're gonna consider material innovations and solutions that could actually really help fashion to rethink the end of life of products. Um, the, the chat is going crazy. There are so many questions, so I'll definitely make find some time now to comb through and see what I can pose to Nina and Florian. Thank you so much for participating and and being so active, it's always great to see. Nina, um, this, this may seem radical or it actually may seem entirely necessary and I have no idea and I would love your steer. Um, if anyone watching today wanted to start a fashion brand, you know, with tangible product, should those brands, these new ones, you know, in 2023 have any reliance on those sort of old conventional standard materials at all? <laughs> um 
Well, I guess, you know, it, it all, I think ultimately it always has to be a multi-pronged approach. I think that's the, the wise way. Um, I would say it's definitely good to look at uh, not necessarily new materials, but look at what you can do with, like we were saying in the beginning, it's about, you know, circularity and keeping products on the same quality level for as long as possible. And that would mean reuse, uh, reinvent, redesign with perhaps existing products or dead stock or whatever. So I think that's that's something that we should always keep in mind when you're a young brand, perhaps. Um, and, you know, I don't think you can be a new brand today uh, and aspiring to be a leading pioneering fashion brand uh, by being tone deaf. I mean, we all know what crisis we're going through. That is the climate and biodiversity crisis. And if you're ignoring that, you're tone deaf. And if you're tone deaf, you are not part of the, the zeitgeist. And that means you're not, fashion isn't really going to be, you're not part of that, of that movement. So I think you cannot be, of course, it means you have to sometimes make compromises. And that then means that you have to maybe work with certain materials that are just, there is no sustainable alternative to it just yet, or perhaps not affordable, et cetera. And you have to make compromises, but ultimately I think you cannot be a new brand and, and ignoring this uh, at all. Mm -hmm. I don't think it would be successful. I'm I'm interested. I, I promise to keep this section promising and like full of hope. And it certainly is. But there is a sort of a scalability question. There's a, you know, the, the fiber gap is discussed in the industry all the time. Um, do you feel that, you know, at Future Fabrics Expo, the things that you represent are these scalable solutions? Like, is it still early days? It still feels, I know you've been going since 2011. It still does feel quite nascent. Um, yeah, what's mm -hmm. your take on that? Well, I would challenge you. You have to come and see it in June um, because well. it doesn't feel nascent at all anymore. They're, most of them are commercially available. That's always yeah. been the point. We want to show the solutions that exist. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you're looking at companies like Lensing uh, or other partners, they are these are big, proper companies who are fully scalable and are have scaled and can do even more. So I do think there is it's a bit of an excuse to say everything's nascent and so on but yes there are lots of innovations that are just emerging that need the support of the industry and of the brands and need to lead the change so yes there are still some constraints for sure some materials are you know they need to see the economies of scale coming through and that's it's all happening i mean it sounds a bit you know um, i'm sure we've heard this before but it really is the material revolution and it's terribly exciting and so many business opportunities in that Sorry, Florian, go ahead. <laughs> no, I think sure you've, you've, you've said it all. I think, uh, yes, it, it's it's still small, but I think a lot of things are happening, right? And I think, you know, if I think back onto 2017, when we launched Refibra, it was a small thing. Now it's, we're talking thousands of tons. And now we're also moving this, you know, talking particularly about circular fibers uh, and uh, fibers with, uh, with, with waste content. I think one exciting topic I would like to mention is that we're also moving moving this into viscose, which is, of course, very much a, a, a mainstream fiber, right? I mean, viscose is, is used in many, many different fabrics and garments, of course. And then as of the second half of this year, our goal is to have also viscose with recycled content. We're going to start at 20%. We're going to move that up stepwise. But that for us is, I would say, the biggest step in circularity in the last years, right? To really put this now into, I mean, and again, of course, it will be traceable. It comes with, with digital and physical traceability. But I think that's that is the one innovation that I'm I personally for this year feel most excited about. Yeah. And maybe one comment because I think this topic comes back, right? What about cost, right? For for circularity. And and at this point, I think we have to be honest to ourselves, right? There is still an extra cost to these materials. It's not because we make more money out of it because we don't, right? Mm -hmm. But it's just that the feedstock itself is more expensive, right? So it might, might sound strange, but indeed, you know, waste. Um, fashion waste, if it's sorted and collected properly, is more expensive than in a sustainably sourced wood, right? It might sound a bit counterintuitive. And I think the industry will take some time and need scale to bring that cost disadvantage down. For the product that we are going to launch in the second half of 2023, it's not a huge cost increase, right? I think it's okay-ish, right? We're not going to talk any details now, but it's not shocking, I would say. I think it's, there's an extra cost, but Knowing how, you know, knowing the cost of other materials, I think it's it's absolutely feasible. But it needs also that adoption by the industry to drive the cost further down. It's a bit like renewable energy, right? At the beginning, solar energy was very expensive, but 
think about it today in certain regions of the world, it's extremely competitive, right? So I think we need to make that joint step and uh, then we can also drive down costs. Yeah, if I, if I may um, add something to this, um, ultimately, you know, going back to the beginning of our discussion, it really is something where the regulator needs to come in and, and create a level playing field so that those who are pioneering companies, they should see incentivizing measures from the government. They should see tax breaks there. Uh, the polluting companies should be penalized for what they're doing. And uh, ultimately, that has obviously a huge effect on on cost and, and the pricing. And that at the moment isn't really uh, done yet. And that urgently needs to change. So hopefully very soon that's going to start to level up. I think there are I mean, so many businesses kind of struggle when they're, you know, they're at the beck and call or at the behest of their shareholders, their stakeholders to make the investments in stuff now that's going to pay off long term. Florian, what would you say to those brands that are reticent to like make spend the extra money to, to you know, dig deep and like engage in this in this space now to kind of future proof them in, in the near and medium term? Yeah. Now, I would certainly invite them to 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 make that uh, make that step and make that leap of faith. I think if you look back, many times the front runs eventually for them it really paid off, right? It paid off nicely. And I think anyway, when you do this, you're not going to do it with all your collections and everything, right? But you're going to do it with a with a start, with a part of your products. And uh, if you look back at some other developments in the past, think about something like, for example, sustainable viscos, uh, which happened uh, four or five years ago. I think those companies that switched to sustainable viscos very early really uh, had a benefit, right? And I think some of them adopted later, but I think the ones that really led the way also got that recognition in the market and from consumers eventually. Mm -hmm. There is a huge question. I can't ignore it. I can see the chat like pinging yeah. away and I'm seeing the same word over and over again, and that's consumerism. Um, you know, fundamentally, we can all do better, but we, yeah. I think as an industry, have created a consumer that needs newness, that demands newness. We give them cheaper, faster options. So naturally, they choose cheaper, faster options. I don't believe this is the consumer's fault. I really do believe that as an industry, we have created these consumption habits. Um, but fundamentally, this is almost like the beginning of the issue. And what can what can be done you know i mean nina you just mentioned you know penalties for fast fashion players but you know what can we do as an industry to really ch kind of change consumption habits it's a mammoth task and i know that's a crazy question but maybe i could come to both of you maybe nina if we start with you um again i would go back to the beginning of our discussion it's about um it's obviously a cultural thing as you said it's a mindset um but I think ultimately it's a lack of understanding of the value behind a product and what goes into it, whether that is design, creativity to the materials and how it's made and how many hands have been involved and where, et cetera, et cetera. And I do think that this, um, the EPR will be really helpful to that, to redirect it from industry as well as, as consumers. So I do think it actually emphasizes what the value is in all of these products, um, human and, and uh, raw materials based. So I think that is ultimately one of the most fundamental things in order to curb the mindless um, consumerism that is being that we've witnessed over the last 20 years massively. So I think that is, I do think the EPR, for example, is really readdressing that thing. But ultimately it's a it's a cultural shift, I think, in our minds. Florian, do you have um, to add? Yeah, I, I agree. I think also the EPR is, I think, you know, incentives in general. The other thing is really transparency. I think the more you talk about where a product comes from, you know, how many hands did it go through, what what distance to travel? Is that really something you want to throw away after five uses, right? And then also think, talk more about the afterlife of this product, right? Because that's something that, you know, of course it starts now appearing in, in, in news and we see pictures of ugly things, but I think it's too distant still, right? If you throw away a garment, it's kind of out of your mind. And I think that also has to change. We need to feel more responsible for throwing away something, right? Because as you, you only consume if you're, if it's easy to throw away your old stuff, right? So, and, and if that becomes more difficult, not only financially, but also mentally, right? To throw stuff away, like throwing away food, mm -hmm. then I think, you know, it will change. Yeah, I agree with you. Florin, you may not remember this, but when we first met, which was now, I think a couple of years ago, we were talking exa exactly about this. And you said that everything we were wearing 
then and there will be on the planet long after we are dead. And mm. it stuck with me, I mean, hugely. It was genuinely, I mean, just so impactful. And I think having, you know, the opportunity to, as you say, to educate, to show transparency, to really think about where your product is going, to like really like viscerally connect with your, with your clothes again is a really important part of this piece. Um, we do have a bit more time left, but it's just really one or two more questions. Um, Florian, across your work, which new materials um, or new material inputs rather are perhaps do you think are the most scalable and significant and um, could really signify change? I think it's really what I think it's really um, waste waste pulp, right? Yeah. So we're using uh, come back to that point because um, it's really we do a lot of great small innovations, but particularly when you're asking about scale, it, it's that one uh, to use pulp made out of uh, waste clothing, um, post and pre-consumer, and to use that as a feedstock, right? So normally we use 100% wood, now we're using wood plus some waste, and to bring up that waste share, I think, you know, it's that's the, the one big thing, right? The holy grail, so to speak, and then the um, we are starting at 20% for viscose, then we're going to go to 30%. And eventually by 2025, we want to offer all of our products in a version where they also contain 50% waste uh, as a feedstock. And I think that is you know, our North Star we're going after. So I'm excited about that journey. Really exciting. And that brings me really to my final question for both of you today. Um, and perhaps, Nina, if we could start with you. This is I said at the start, this is a huge question. And I mean, we I think we could sit and talk about it for hours and hours, but I would love to know among the, the sort of scary statistics, the real extent of the problem that we're kind of facing as an industry, what brings you hope for the future? Um, well, I guess the ingenuity that's within all of us to actually really rethink and have the capacity to reimagine what we've done wrong, the realization of it and how quickly you can um, actually do make a change. So I think to, to, to understand how much agency we all have to really make that work, whether that is through how we vote, what we wear, what we purchase. Um, so I think that absolutely gives me hope. And we see it every day with the innovations that are coming up, new products coming up, uh, reinventing. And just simply, as, as Florian was saying, just, you know, the amount of post-consumer uh, products, uh, post-consumer waste products that are coming through and become feedstocks, that is, that is fantastic to really close the loop. Exciting. Florian, what brings you hope? Brings me hope. I think eventually, I think, Thinking very broad, I think you know, humanity has has tackled and survived many crises, and we've been on this planet for a long time. So I hope that you also tackle this one, and it starts all with insight, with the realization that something is really wrong, mm. and uh, also hope that we that we don't stand in the way of the right regulation and, and legislation, right? That we don't overdo it. You know? um, that a lot of people are trying to. <sighs> Uh, influence, shape decision making and regulation, but I hope that we really don't, you know, just really think as as as, as people, as also human beings, that we let this happen and uh, take the let the right legislation take shape because I think that's what it needed, right? We need that external help and shape and push. As an industry alone, we're not going to, we don't, will not change it. I think that is the the perfect note to end today's discussion on. Thank you both so much, Florian and Nina. So much expert insight. I could have kept you talking for hours. I've learned so much. So I'm sure the BOF community has too. I mean, the chat function is an indication of just how engaged everyone has been. So thank you so much um, for being with us and taking time out of your day to join in on such an important conversation. Um, I want to thank the BOF team behind the scenes, Neve and Polly in particular. They make this so slick and so easy so we can just rock up. Thank and you. With it. It's so fab. And thank you yes, so much for taking time out, of your, time out of your day to engage. If you missed any part of today's conversation, it's all available to watch on YouTube on demand right after we close. Thanks again, Florian and Nina. I'll see you soon, I'm sure. And we'll thank welcome you. back to BOF Live soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, thank Alice. you so much.